Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. And we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll be picking up at verse 12. Where we we got all the way through verse eleven last week, where we saw the cool I mean some of the cool gifts of God's Spirit that He gives us by His Holy Spirit, the gifts like words of wisdom, words of knowledge, where you just you don't know the answer and you just ask the Lord and He just gives you the answer. That's a sweet one, by the way. I think uh, for those of you who have ever ever experienced, you know, the Bible says if we lack wisdom, what are we supposed to do? Yeah. Ask. You ask God, and don't worry, God knows your frame. He knows, like, he. It, it, some of you, all he has to do is, like, just put the, the seed of the thought in your brain, and you got the answer. Some of you, he's got to spell it out with visual aids, you know, and, and uh, you know, like, or send someone. Sometimes he just, you need help, and he has to send someone to actually be there and do it with you and instruct you, you know. I, I remember when I first learned to tear down an engine, um, this, this dear brother, Dave St. Clair, came to our church and he this is in Arizona and the irony is now he lives here in Kona and we, we're both serving the Lord here but this is many 30 plus years ago and he showed up at my house and I'm sitting there trying to tear down my engine because it's lost all its compression and a couple cylinders and I need to bore out the whole thing and you know put in new sleeves and I don't know I mean I know in theory what you're supposed to do but it's totally different than actually do any of you have ever done this, you know, it's a totally different process to actually get in there and tear everything off your engine down to the block. And um, he shows up and he has a thing called a speed wrench. And it's not a ratchet like mine, it's just a handle that's kind of goosenecked and he just gets on there and just starts, you know, spinning this thing and tearing the whole engine down and just setting stuff aside. And he like, I'm like, don't you need to like label where it goes? He goes, no, I know where it goes. And, uh, it was so nice to work with someone who knew what they were doing and could guide me through. Now, I'm a hands-on learner, so for some of you, you know, you might be the same way. I learn really well if I get to put my hands on, do it, put it back together, and then, then I actually remember. It. You know, I don't remember stuff so well if I just sometimes, you know, casually saw it. I don't know if that's the same for you, but, but when you get to the place where you don't know what to do in life, and that happens in our lives... God says, I gave you my Holy Spirit. And my Holy Spirit can give you words of wisdom. Can give you words of knowledge. When you And, and guys, how do, you know, these are gifts from God. They're, but it's sometimes people go, oh, yeah, well, it just happened. No, it didn't just happen. We have a living God. And, and a really cool living God that gives us his spirit as a, he says, as an earnest deposit to let you know that he's real. Like when people say, how do you know God's real? I said, you ever been about to do something wrong and you, you get that little, that, that voice that you know is not you. Because that's not you thinking, I shouldn't do this. You, you're going, the voice is going, don't do it. You're going to regret it. Anyone ever had this happen? You're about to do something. And this voice comes in and you're, you're going, you're pretty sure that's not you thinking that. Where'd that come from? That's the Spirit of God. The Bible says the Holy Spirit convicts the world concerning sin. It's his job. He, now, conviction isn't con- condemning you for sin. Conviction, is, even though they both start with the letter C, conviction is what the Spirit of God does. Condemnation is what the devil does. They both point out that we, are, that we have sin. The difference is the direction it drives us. When you're convicted by the Spirit of God, it drives you back to God. When you're condemned by the devil, what does it do? drives you, you go, oh, I'm not even worth being, I shouldn't even go to church, right? The devil goes, why should you go to church? You're, you're a scum, man. You mess up and, and you, you know, you're just going to wreck it for everyone else. You should not go. That's called condemnation, okay? That's, that's pointing out our sin in a way to drive you away from God. And the devil's a pro at that. He's a pro. But let me tell you, God's Spirit's even better pro at working with us. And, and he's a marvelous, marvelous gift from God and he says God says I'll give you my spirit so that you you'll be a seal until the day that you're redeemed it's like a 
property of God's seal. He just marked us with His Spirit and said, that's my property until, until the day of redemption belongs to me. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about that. I may even known that verse that it says we are sealed by the Holy Ghost until the day of redemption. A lot of people heard the idea, but it hasn't really sunk into their being that, that you belong to God now. You know, you're his, you're his property. He's, he considers you special. You know, like, you, you got like a little, you know, mark from the Spirit of God on you that says, property of God. You know, how folks put those little things on their athletic about property of the person. You're, you belong to the Lord. And God goes, and I know you can't do this on your own. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let my Holy Spirit help you. And that's what we're beginning to see today. The parts that the Spirit does, these, He gives us gifts so we, can, so we can function in this life. I mean, we need help. If you don't think you need help, you're probably not going to like the sermon. But, but if you realize that you're not made to do this on your own, you'll really appreciate the next part that Paul's going to teach the Corinthian church. Because look at what he says next. Let's look together here at verse 12. Now, Paul, Paul is explaining to these guys, Hey, guys, you know, we, we were given the gifts of the Spirit of God by, by not our choice. What did verse 11 say? Who... Who wills which gift we get? Do you remember last week we ended with this verse, verse 11? First Corinthians 12, 11 says, It is the Spirit of God that distributes each one of us, to, to each one of us individually just as He wills. It's His choice. He gets to choose which gift we get. Not, not, we can ask, but it's ultimately the Spirit of God gets to choose. And you know what, guys? The Spirit of God knows which gift will suit you the best. Now, next week is Palm Sunday, following week is Easter. So today I'm not even going to try to do this whole, the rest of this chapter. I'm going to do just the next uh, portion of this chapter, which Paul's going to describe how, how we fit together in this thing. Because the problem with gifts, some people think, well, they're only for certain people. You know, those special people or something the favored ones of god they get the gifts or they get the good gifts and i'm going to show you something today paul totally spanks that idea like that is the most stupidest thing there is but he uses a great analogy to do it and one that helps me understand the working of god in, in the body of christ how does god work out things it's him giving us these gifts but does any one of us mean less to God than another? Does he go, well, oh, I only like Jan. And she was falling asleep. I was trying to get her back. She didn't get any sleep. I snored all night, I heard. So sorry, honey. Yeah. Go to the neighbors. Go to the neighbors. And the, pa and the pastor didn't. You know, this, this is a rough night. I, I, I had one of those nights. I guess she said I just kept gurgling and, and choking all night. And uh, I hate that because when I wake up, I feel exhausted. I don't feel like I feel more tired now than when I went to bed. And I was tired when I went to bed. So I just go, Lord, give me grace to do this. This is where this is where I have found what Paul said: When I am weak, then I am what strong. But not in your own strength. You have to lean on the strength of the Lord. So this is, I pray the sermon comes out good in a way that you receive from something from it because my brain feels like scrambled eggs right now as, as far as, you know, tiredness on the tired scale. But the passage of scripture we're looking at, I love. I love it because it teaches me the importance of every single person in the body of Christ. There's no one that is like better or, or, or worse, lesser in the body of Christ. And I'll show you how the example Paul uses. I think it's a great one. You, you might have heard this part before. Look with me at verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. He says, For even as the body is one body, we're one body of Christ, correct? Yet it says, the body has many members. Now, look at this, this earthly body. We have one body given to us. Yet it has many parts. I mean, it's got your toes, your shin, your knee bone connected to your, you know, you guys know that whole song, right? He says, but all these parts, he says, yet they are all, though they are many, they are all members of the, of the body. And they are all of one body, so also is Christ. He says, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. 
Whether we were Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all made to drink from one spirit, from the Holy Spirit. He says, for the body is not one member, but it's many members. And it says, if the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. Paul says, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the ear would say, well, I'm not an eye. He says, it is not, therefore I am not part of the body. It is not for this reason any less a part of the body. He says, if the whole, the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? I mean, what, can you imagine a whole body composed of ears? We have an ear right here on the eyebrow, one for the eye, one in the nose, one in the mouth. And you, be, you look at it and go, that body is messed up, man. It's a bunch of ears. It, it, it'd be kind of eerie. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I didn't come up with that. He did. <laughs> he said, but, but God, <laughs> listen to this, God has placed each member each one of us, in the body, just as he desired. Now, if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, and it says, but there is only one body. He keeps stressing this idea. Only one body, many members. Now, he goes on, he uses this example, he says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't have any need of you. Or again, the head would say to the feet, I don't need, I don't need you guys either. I mean, how ridiculous would that be? My head said, I don't need my feet to get me around. I mean, they're there for a reason. And then he says, on the contrary, it is much truer that members of the body, which seem to be weaker, or in the King James, the comely parts, the not so fancy, you know, you, you look at a liver or a gizzard, or you're like, eh, it looks kind of gross, you know, gooey. And he says, even though these parts... Some people consider these to be the weaker parts. Paul says they're really the necessary parts. He says, And those members on the, of the body which we deem less honorable, on those we bestow a more abundant honor. And on our less presentable members will they become much more presentable. I like how the King James puts it. On our uncomely members, they become, well, blessed with more abundant comeliness. You go, what does that mean? He goes, let me just read further and it'll make sense. He says, whereas the, the more pre- presentable or comely members, they have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to the members which lack, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. For if one member suffers, you guys know this, right? How many members suffer if one suffers? All the members suffer. And if one member is honored then all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are Christ's body and individually members of it. Now, Paul is saying, guys, there's parts of our body that are, you know, uncomely. and they're not, they're not anything we would go, wow, look at that liver, isn't it special? Or look at that, you know, we had a bunch of internal organs that, gallbladders, you know, like, what? Yeah, you go... I don't want to be the gallbladder for Jesus, you know. Let me be some something more important on the outside to see me. No one will see me. I'm just inside doing my job. And you know, in the body of Christ, Paul says God has put more actual honor on the parts that are actually not seen than the parts that are seen. Interestingly enough, he puts it in a way that if you study the Greek, it's it actually means you can get along with some of the stuff that you see on the outside. You could lose it and still still function as a body. But there are parts on the inside you can't, you can't live without. And even though we, we, we deem them less honorable because we don't see them, they actually deserve the more honor. I mean, if we don't have the heart pumping, you don't see it, right? I mean, you don't see the heart. You don't see the gizzard. You don't see the liver doing its job. You don't see these parts that are inside your body doing their job. But think about it. You could lose your hand and still live. You, you, you lose your heart, you're, it's over. Lungs, goner. You, you lose your liver, it's only a matter of time. You know, there are parts in the body, God says, I put them there, and, and this is, by the way, this is a great example for church. Because in churches, there are people in the church that I call them the, the 
behind the scenes folks you know they're, they're you never see them up front you never know that they're there and yet without their effect on the whole of the body they're the they're the heart and the liver and the and the lungs and the and and, and they're the parts that are that are purifying and pray, they're, they're in the prayer closet in the back just praying fervently for the work of the Lord and p nobody may ever see them does that make them less no way man those are the important parts of the body. There was a man named Finney that was used, I believe, in the, I want to say 17, late 1700s to 1800s for a massive revival over across the pond, we'd say. You know, not, not here. But he was, um, he was a man that preached with, with a fervency of, guys, if you, if you don't know this grace of, of God, the sweet grace that say we're saved by grace. He said, if you don't know that, then you're gonna burn. And and he was he was at a, had the heart of an evangelist, you know, because he didn't want to see anybody perish. He just wanted everyone to know about this great gift of salvation. And so he would preach his sermons with such fervor. And he was a little country church, and there was like nobody coming. And so he said, you know. To the, to, he, he got his, his wife and a couple folks to come and he said, you know what we need is, we need to pray. But nobody's going to see prayer. We need to, and they were suggesting we should have a campaign, evangelism, you know, put up a tent or something and, and, and make like a circus and draw the people in. And he goes, no, we need to pray. It, it says, no one comes to the Father except that the Spirit of God draws them. So we need to pray that God's Spirit would draw the souls that He wants to touch. So He got the couple, just a small couple people to commit to being the ones that would pray. And so they started to pray and someone came and checked out their church. Just, just like, this is way out in the sticks. Just stop by and check it out. Don't know why, just felt like I should stop. Wonder why that is, huh? Just, just felt like I, and stopped and, 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 he preached with fervor that you, you, if you haven't tasted this great grace of God, you need to. Because this grace will save you from hell and damnation. It will free you from all that bondage of sin. It will make you like a weight lifted from your shoulders. And he just preached and preached. And the person at the end, well, they didn't know the Lord. So at the end, he gave an altar call. Anyone want... And, the, the funny thing is, there's only the few people there praying. And he told them, look, there's someone coming. You guys pray. Pray the whole time I preach. Well, the guy got saved. Got really excited. And they said, welcome to the club. Now, we have to pray next week for God to draw whoever else needs the gospel. So the brand new Christian, he's like, you got to join in and pray. And they, they began to do this as just their habit was, let's pray. For instead of having campaigns, they prayed. And pretty soon, people started coming to this church from all over. And pe when, when they got there, there wasn't enough room for the prayer guys to be in. So they went down in the boiler room, down below, and they prayed down below while the service was going on upstairs. And he kept preaching the same message. you got to come to know this grace. you got to, you know, you need salvation. Turn from your sin. And he, he's straight You'd say, you know, straight out evangelist preaching away. Well, this this happened over and over, and a, and a revival sparked. And every time people got saved, after they they heard him preach a couple times, like, well, you know the Lord now. Go down in the go down in the boiler room. Join the rest of the guys praying. And there was times he sent everyone to the boiler room, and the church would be empty. And he'd just go, keep doing your job, and he keep. Telling them to pray, and then people would come in, and he would preach to them again. And, you know, some people say, well, in retrospect, you know, because guys always like to find out what works, you know, ministries. They will like, compare. They shouldn't do this, by the way. You never compare your ministry to another man's ministry. That's a mistake. But people do this in their own human nature. And, and guys started going, how come Finney has this huge church, and all these souls are getting saved, and... And when they went to, to look at him, they're like, he's nothing special. There's no special building. There's no special, per, you know. And I know, I, I think I know why it was so special. 
It was the part you didn't see. It was the guys in the boiler room praying fervently for the souls. And, and some people say, now I got a question for you. So who was more important in the role of the ministry, of Finney's ministry? Finney, the, the evangelist preacher, or the parts that you didn't see behind the scene? See, because this is, I truly believe it was the guys behind the scenes praying that made the big outpouring of God's Spirit, that, that they experienced that revival. I don't think the revival would have had touched the folks it did without that prayer. And see, some people go, but that's, what, what big deal does that do? You know, what does that do, anyway? I mean, how much stuff gets taken care of when we pray? Everything. See, but the church is not admonished. You know what? Okay, well, you guys fill this in, the, fill in the blank. The Bible says to pray without what? Ceasing. Ceasing. So, what's that mean? Always. Always. Don't stop praying. But the church today goes, well, we'll let, we leave that for the, 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 the Saturday morning men's prayer group or the, the women's group when they have their prayer time on Tuesday night or whatever. You know, whenever, they, they like designate, here's a time. And by the way, we have a Saturday morning men's prayer. You're, you're right here. This is where we were praying, you know, just yesterday we were praying right here. But that's not the only time I pray. I mean, it's not like, oh, I only pray once a week when the guys are together. No, that's, that's just to come together in agreement and pray, God, you do what you want to do, and may we be used in your plan. May we walk in, in, in your footsteps. May we follow your leading and, and step where you want us to step. Because that's when I see cool things happen. When I seek the Lord and say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. You show me your will. And some folks always say, oh, Pastor, I wish that things would happen for me. Like, like I hear, you know, when you share your, those testimonies, like they happen for you. I, I want them to happen for me like that. And I'm just thinking, I'm not anything special. I, I know this inside. I know it's not any special. I just know that God is special. And His Spirit is powerful. And His Spirit was given as a gift. And some of you, whether you realize it or not, I said last week, there's more gifts than what we went over last week. Those were just the intro to the, to the gifts, what he was telling them at, at the Church of Corinth there, those words of wisdom and those, the, those, those words of knowledge and healings and miracles and, and prophecy, you know, those, those things are, those are all great. But one of the gifts of the Spirit is called the gift of intercession. It's to pray. We, we did it on Tuesday night. I, I read it to the guys that came out on Tuesday night. In Jude, he says that we are to pray in the Holy Ghost. We have the Holy Spirit to help us pray. And, the, and I went over this last week. The, I, I don't know if you... I think I did it on Tuesday. Gosh, man, I'm so tired. I can't remember which study I did it in. Sorry about that. But but uh, when he said to pray in the Holy Ghost, it says that, that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with moanings and groanings too deep for what? For words, for understanding. We don't even... You know, sometimes we are so... Have you ever been in a place where you can't even put it in where you're like... <sighs> yeah, you're there now. Okay. Perfect. This is this is you know if you if you're if you're a really good friends. I, I shared this. If you're really really close to someone, you grew up with them, you spent time, you've been around each other all your lives, and you, one of you is having a bad day, and 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 you can't put it into words, but you get around your friend and you're like, <sighs> and they go, yeah, I know what you mean. Because they know you that well. That, that's the uh, uh, frustration, the, 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 the door stuck and it broke and everything went wrong. and it just Or it could be the uh, of, of something's aching in my heart. Or the, uh, and you're mourning because you just saw a picture that reminded you of, you know, your dad when he was alive. And what he, you know, so, something that, and they can tell. They know you that well. That was that moan was this moan, and this moan was that. That groan was this. This was. That's great. But how many of us have someone that close to us that actually can read, even down to a groan, or a moan? What what would you know? Because you're communicating. You're just not putting it in words. By the way, they say that what we communicate. This is the funniest thing. 
being, I always ask the Lord, why did you pick me to preach the gospel? English is my second language. I don't even do it well. And then I found out that over 95% of what is communicated in, a, in, in public speaking is, is not the words that you choose. It is how you speak those words that communicates the message. Because you can say the same words, but with a different tone, with a different delivery, and they, and they mean completely different things. So 95% of our communication, that's pretty high up there. It's not the exact perfect enunciation or, 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 or dictation. All the speaking of the correct sentence structure of our words, that has nothing to do with it. It's getting the idea across. And that happens a lot of times non-verbally. You, you don't think so? Watch some of those preachers on TV and then just turn down the volume. And watch their, their, their body language. You know, some of them, honestly, it, this is a really interesting, you, you know, since I'm a teacher, I take note of other guys' ministry styles. Some of them, you know, you turn the volume down on the, on the Christian station, and the guys go, like, <laughs> and, and you're like, <laughs> sorry, you know, I mean, like, literally, the guy freaked me out, just, I'm like, he, he turned the volume back up, and he's screaming, you're going to hell, you're going to, you know, you, I thought that's what he was saying, but it wasn't, you know, yeah, you turn like that, and, and you're, you're like, wow, now, I personally knew I was going to hell before I came to the Lord, <laughs> that wasn't even like a question, my question was, how do I not do that? You know, what's the answer? Not, you know, I mean, so these guys are so condemning that they forgot the grace. The gospel is a gospel of good news. It's good news, not condemnation. You know, Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to do what? Save it. He did not come to condemn. So when the guy is preaching, if you can turn down the volume and it looks like he's still preaching grace, then the words will be lining up with the rest of the message, the, the nonverbal cues. But when they don't line up, that's when we have trouble. Listening to someone who is saying one thing out of their mouth and their body language and, the, and their tone and everything else is saying something completely different. You know, you can say some things that sound correct, but you can do it with a really mean spirit. Have you ever met someone that can say something with like a mean tone, but they said the nice words? I love you too. <laughs> drop dead. I mean, they didn't say drop dead, but you know, just the way that. Have you ever been punched in the gut like that with an "I love you"? That sucks. I mean, I hate to say this, but oh, uh, scratch that out of the thing. They, you know, when someone says it like in the wrong tone, the wrong body language, that's not "I love you." That's not "I love you." That's that's wrong. And when we come to share these things, this is. Paul, Paul's got these, these beautiful things he's sharing about the Spirit, the intricacies of the Spirit. And he's saying, guys, hey, all of us make up just one body. Now, when one member of this body hurts, when our brother is struggling, what does the Bible say? All of us feel that hurt. If you don't think your whole body isn't wired together, I submit to you, I'll do a test with you. I'll get the hammer. You put your thumb here. I'm just going to do a quick test. I'll just give it a quick, sharp whack. Right? I mean, what happens when we, when we hit our thumb? Just, just, my mouth joins in. Ow. No way. Man, when, when, when my thumb gets hurt, it's amazing how the rest of the body comes. <laughs> Jump, run, get the ice, stick it in. I mean, the, the whole body comes into this orchestrated motion of, this is important. We got a problem. And, and like, to the brain, pain. Oh, wake up, everybody. And the whole body comes awake. You, you hurt yourself bad. I defy you to not have your rest of your members come to full attention. It just happens when one part gets hurt bad, the whole body goes, oh, we got a problem. What are we going to do? Rush in. Grab it. Come on. Oh, no. It's blue. Oh, it's dirty purple. Oh, it's throbbing. Run. Get the ice. Stick it in. You know, we, 
we get the whole body involved. Sometimes we do a little dance in between because we just don't know what else to do. Isn't that strange that the whole body's just... And nobody, nobody like, said, Hey, guys, when one part gets hurt, let's all get involved. Your body does it automatic. But the body of Christ has been deceived into thinking, Yeah, so I'm poor, but I'm not really important. And don't, it doesn't really matter if I'm there or not there. What's it matter? It matters a lot. What if you're the part that's next to this part that... When it gets hurt, you're the one coming close, first one to the first one to the scene. What if you're the one that's supposed to be there, going, "I got you." I mean, it's funny. My, not this isn't funny. My wife, one day she came into the church. I'm up there doing the worship, and I look back, and she's like this, and and she's got her hand cup like this, and I think she's got a baby bird in her hand. She's a little bit late coming in to the service, and you know we're all up there doing the worship, and and I'm looking at her from the. You know, she comes through the doors. This is when we had the building many years ago, and she's like this. And and, I she's looking down like really, you know, really intent, and I think it's a it's a it's a. I know her. She's so so. so it's a baby bird fell down. She's bringing it in. She's gonna go find Aaron or something. Say, what do we do with this baby bird or something? And it wasn't. She had closed the door on her finger, in, uh, and, it, and it crushed it. And so it turned, it had turned purple, and it was she was back there. And I'm doing the worship, trying to figure out what's the big deal. They're trying to get my attention, you know. And then she, they get someone else, and they know the friend that's a doctor up the road, so they put her in the car and take her up there. And and uh, doctor looks at it, and it's crushed. And he's like, look, it's crushed. It's still to this day kind of goes to the side, crushed. And so she's like, she's like, um, he goes, it's, there's nothing we can do to it. You know, it's just got to heal. And uh, it, it's, it's smashed. And I can give you some painkillers, you know, but I, I, I watched and I thought, when I found out what it was, I realized I totally misread. You know, when you're up there leading worship, and you're trying to figure out, what's, what's going on with my wife? Why is she like this? And, it's funny, if you're not close enough, you don't know. Even though, I mean, this is my wife, but she's across the room from me. I don't, I can't read what, what's going on. I, sometimes to feel someone's pain, you got to be <coughs> right next to them. you got to get close to them and, and be like, hey, what's up? And there's a, there's a function of that. You know, my body parts do real well when they get to pay attention to one another. When they get close to each other. My, when this thumb got hit with a hammer, I didn't take this hand and say, well, you'll just get a, get along over there. Hey, right, buddy. No, man. This hand came rushing in. Get right in on the job. I mean, you got there's some throbbing going on. We got to get in here and do something. And if the church pretends, well, I'm not really, no big deal. They don't even need me. I'll just hang out over here. Have you ever met Christians that are like, I don't go to church anymore. I used to do that. I don't need it anymore. Who says you need it? How about you're needed by someone else? But you're so far over across the room that they're hurting and you you can't even read it right. Can this happen? It does. It happens in the body of Christ to our shame. That's because the Bible says in the last days they will forsake what? Gathering together of themselves. You know, just just getting together like this is a sweet thing. But just hanging out like this is when we can be with each other and find out things. You know, the last time we had home church, someone afterwards said, man, I'm so glad we got rained out. Because I, I got to hang out like and like after, you know, and like, you know, because usually at the beach we're packing up all this stuff and putting it on the trailer and getting all this stuff done. And <laughs> people are getting prayer over there with Herb and this is going on and... And they go, and you know, at your house, we just kind of hung out after. And um, one person hung out, and uh, we, 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 afterwards, they, they, they didn't have anywhere to go. We didn't know. But we said, we want to, we're going to have a bite of a lot of leftover food that day. We're going to eat. Let's eat, you know. And, and something about taking a meal together, I think it's very scriptural. You know, it's just a good thing for our, for our fellowship. So 
having a little bite, and um, the kids wanted to watch a movie. And it was like one of those, I don't know, like Disney kind of, you know, kid movie thing. And I didn't know that this person was really hurting. And they laid there on the couch over there watching the screen and, and, and watching the movie. And that movie led to, well, let's watch another, you know, you want to watch another one? Okay. And they stayed there all day watching movies. And afterwards they went, man, this was the best day ever of church. I got to be with your family and see your family and just feel like I'm in a family. You know, because I don't have that. And, and they just, they just like thought, what a great day. And we were just thinking, it's a chill day. It's raining. There's nothing really, I mean, what are you going to do? It's raining outside where we're, we got the house, praise the Lord. We're just hanging out. But you know, you can't get close to someone if you're just rushing off. Going off to do your thing and you don't have time for anyone or you don't. You you go you just go well I just you know I don't have time for church right now I, I'm still a Christian but I don't you know they don't need me or I don't need them I'm doing good some some people are like that I don't I don't really need to go because I'm I'm pretty good today I'm solid <laughs> let me tell you what <laughs> if you're doing solid you better show up <laughs> well I guarantee that when what says when one is weak the other is strong right. Well, if you're the strong one that day, you better get there because there'll be a weak one there for sure. There's always the compliment. There's always the other one that needs the help. And if God blessed you and you're having a strong day, great, man, that's awesome. Get to church. Because that means that you've got a divine appointment. There's going to be someone that you'll be able to use your strength to share with somebody that maybe doesn't have strength that day. You know, just two Sundays ago, a young, a young man was sitting underneath the tree to my right. He had tattoos all over. His name is Bob, slender guy. He was sitting there, and, and he, was, he was sitting there, and he was listening to the message, doing his little yoga stretch or something, someone said. And one of the visitors was sitting like where, where, where Roger and Carol were sitting. They were looking at me, but he was in their, in their peripheral vision just right past me. And so I kept feeling led to pray for him. And when the service was over, they walked, the fellow walked over and said, so um, what did you think of what the pastor was talking about? Uh, you know, did, oh, that really really spoke to me. He said, um, are you a Christian? No. Would you like to be? Yes. What do I have to do? You know, I mean, the guy led him to the Lord while we were breaking the tents down. And then led him over to me afterwards and said, this is Bob, he just gave his life to the Lord. I was like, Super cool way to end, you know, while you're putting away the stuff. You find out this kid gives us a, and And we had a guy, a young man visiting. He said, I, I pastored a little work in California somewhere and praying about coming out here with some of my friends and church planting. And we saw what you're doing. We, is it okay if I come to your church? I don't want to, like, if it's not okay, not come. I was like, of course you can come. You know? Wow. Another labor in the, in the harvest. Shame, shame, terrible. Don't come. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yes, come. So, so he's sitting there, and he he hears the man say, "I just introduced this guy to the Lord." And I'm still breaking down stuff, and I look at him, and the Lord goes, "Just tell him to talk to him." So, would you mind talking to him? He just gave his life to the Lord. I'd be glad to, Pastor. So he takes over. We break everything down. Get done. A half hour later, they're still sitting at the table talking. I come over. We talk with him for about another hour and a half. And I, I, I told some of the folks, I was starving by then. I, I, I eat small meals every couple hours. By then I'm like, oh man, I'm hungry, Lord. And I go over there and I, I just want to check how's things going, are you doing good, and any questions, Bob? And the kid is just like a sponge, man. He just, just soaking in everything about Jesus. And it's so cool. And so I share with them, we stay there at least another hour and a half. And, and, and when I'm done, I get in the car, I'm driving home and I'm thinking, Lord, I'm not hungry at all. And he reminded me of that scripture, you know, when Jesus, the disciples went away and he was ministering to the woman and they, they came back and, with the food and he goes, I, I'm not hungry. They go, who snuck him something? Did you guys bring him something? He said, I had food to eat that you know not of. And he was busy doing the Father's business. It was the coolest thing. I, the Lord just reminded me of that verse that, you know, you're not hungry because you were doing what I, what I wanted you to do. But see, all I had to do to be used is what? Be present. Just a matter of be there. 
I mean, some people make it way too complicated. I want to be using the Lord. I'm like, then be there. Show up. Whoops. And, and they go, but what will I do? I said, I don't know. But I know who knows. The Holy Spirit. Because He made you, and He made you the part He made you to be, and He knows what part you're supposed to be, and He knows what you're supposed to do. And He'll give you what you're supposed to do. All you got to do is show up. You know, you might not even realize it. You already showed up today, and there's a reason God sat you next to the people around you. So you guys can have fellowship, so you can be used to encourage each other. If if one is mourning, what, what does it say? Weep with those that weep. Rejoice with them that rejoice. You know, right? Mourn with them that mourn. When, when you, when, All it takes is just to be with the person. And God helps you to help that person through their trial. But just got to be there. So, if, if you feel like, I'm not important, all I could do, what can I do, Pastor? All I could do is pray. You are a really important part of the body. A part that the American church has actually become very negligent about. The American church is lazy when it comes to prayer. Do you guys know that in the Korean church, they show up two, 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 two and a half hours early before the service starts. And they come and they literally get on their knees or on their face and pray to God for, for a couple hours before service. The way the believers that we met from the Korean church came to our church they they saw us setting up and doing everything and and I saw a couple of the elderly fellows going off to the side and all they were doing was sitting there praying. And I went over to him and said, "Would you guys mind? Could I ask you to pray for me for the whole time? Because I I get a lot of attacks while we're setting up and stuff. You know, the enemy's trying to sidetrack me. And would you guys mind taking over um, standing guard spiritually for me?" And they go, "We'd be glad to." And they're sitting there praying in Korean fervently. You know, for me. Now, does it count if they pray in another language? Does God go, oh, I can't do Korean. I don't know. I can't do I don't know. You know, yeah, he. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is, that's fantastic. But that's. That's the exception, not the rule. I mean, think about how much travel... In, in the travels of your experiences... Well, Raj, you've gone around a bit in the Lord. How many churches have you been to in America where they arrive early to pray, just to pray? That they start their service with prayer. But Jesus said, my Father's house is to be called a house of what? Prayer. Not a house of worship, not a house of Bible teaching, a house of prayer. So when people... I mean, if they want to know what is, what are we marked by when, when well, if you go to that church, you know what they're going to do, right? They should be able to right away. I would hope they'd say, "Man, if you go there, you'll get prayer." Those guys pray, but see, we we're not really known for that. You go there, that pastor's a good teacher, or you go there, that guy's an evangelist. You go there, they got a they got a really great worship team. I I, I don't hardly ever hear. Oh, if you go to that church. Those guys pray. I mean, they and they get answers. By the way, if we did pray all the time, would we get answers? Always. Always. So, are we going to follow the admonishment of the scripture and pray without ceasing, and be marked as the people that pray? Like I like, I personally would like to ask if you wouldn't mind. Every time you ever think about me sharing the gospel, you become like one of those guys in the boiler room for Finney. Only you do it for me. You just say, Lord, help that pastor preach whatever. You just fill his mouth with your words. Because that's all Finney would tell him to do. You just pray God puts my, his words in my mouth. He knows who's coming in the door. He knows what they need to hear that day. I don't want them to hear me. I want them to hear his voice. I'm just the, I'm just the little speaker that transmits through. That's a cool thing. That, that By the way, that guy's just that model of ministry I learned at Bible school in 1979 and I thought I still haven't seen it done in America I haven't seen it. I've heard of great revivals that were actually follow this kind of same idea started in prayer 
with people who thought they're not important. We're behind the scenes. Nobody sees us. Oh, God sees you. Don't worry. And as far as the body is concerned, you're really important. Prayer is that thing that purifies and purges. It's like the liver cleansing, you know, taking out stuff out of the bloodstream and getting it out, on its way out of the body. We can't have the toxic stuff in the church that's killing the church. But we don't have the prayer that's like that, you know, the circulation system, how it pulls away the waste and brings the fresh oxygen. And There's all this internal workings in our body that work to keep us healthy. And prayer, I submit to you, is spiritually part of the plan that God has to keep us healthy as a church. Or just one body. Many members. But some of you are going, I'm not that big a deal. And I submit to you, you're a bigger deal than you realize. They can chop off the outer parts. They don't really need us. But you got to have those inner parts for the church to survive. We need prayer to have the church survive. Yeah. I was told that you, uh, this is my first day coming to your church, but uh -huh. I was told that um, Pastor Izzy, I assume that's you, yes, me. is um, a, a church of action, that there's a miracle that's taking place in your congregation. So Only by God's that. grace. Yeah, that's cool. I was cool. invited by um, that lady over there by four Sophia. months ago. Cool. I, well, I, I'm grateful to hear that, you know. That the Lord is the one who answers prayer. When people say, Oh, you have these miracles happen for you, but it doesn't happen for me. I, I'm not special. Let me reiterate this. God is special. But I pray all, uh, when I take it literal, I pray all the time. I just go, like for me, it's just a constant companion. I have the Lord to talk to all day, all night. It doesn't matter. Wake up, good morning, Lord. I mean, that's what I do when I wake up. I'm like, good morning, Lord. I had a rough night. I mean, this is my prayer this morning. Man, I, I, I feel really tired, Lord. Like, this pillow wants me to stay attached. Like, I didn't want to get out of bed. I just, Jan, I don't, I don't feel very rested. She goes, you didn't sleep very good. I didn't? She's like, no, you kept me up till three. And then she gets up at four to go cook the breakfast. So she had one hour. You know, li literally, if I kept her up till three, she, 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 she what? Oh, she slept till five. Wow. Two hours. So lazy. <laughs> and then she cooked all the food. And served it. And served it. I have a great wife, guys. So I tell you, this is enough for today. That we just, we should close in prayer. Finish. So, Father, we come to you. A God that hears all our prayers and uh, knows our heart, Lord. We pray for Joey. You would give him the right place. You direct him to the right couch, Lord. And uh, a one that would be safe for him, Lord. Keep him away from temptation. Keep him going on that straight and narrow that you have, Lord, that you illuminate the path for him. Put him the right in the right place to go, Lord, that he could walk after you and see what you have for him. For Tiari, Lord, for Angie's granddaughter, we pray for her. And pray for her mom. Comfort to both of them. Touch of healing, relief from the migraines, Lord. For Carla, for her neck, Lord, just continue to touch for, of your spirit to help her. And for Brian Stebbins and his daughter, Roberta, I pray for both of them. And, and the son that's over in Idaho that's trying to make arrangements that, to bring Dad over there. Lord, I just pray for that whole situation, your, your guidance and direction, Lord. There's so many things that we, we, we have to bring to your throne of grace today, Lord. We don't end this as our time of prayer, Lord. We just begin this as our as our day of prayer in agreement with each other, Lord, that we can kick off our prayer time together on this beautiful day and we can come to your throne of grace. Give us your grace and mercy, Lord, as we need it. And we ask that for each person here, pray special Blessing on Sophia and Mick as they get married this week on Tuesday. That your spirit would be poured out on them. We just thank you, Lord, for that, that gift that you give. You said he who finds a wife finds a good thing, Lord, and, and obtains favor from you. So thanks for the favor for Mick. And thanks for my favor, Lord, of my bride. I pray for the young men that want their brides to show up. <laughs> just pray that uh, you bring them the right ones. And uh, from you, Lord, as you blessed us. 
the closest time, Lord, of our service, but open the time of prayer to follow you to the rest of this day. In Jesus' name. Everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.